Welcome back to the concert lectures. Pleased to see you again. Those of you who have been to the first few know that they have been uh, fine lectures that have been very stimulating. We've had some great times of Q&A. Look forward to some more good conversation today. Thanks again to Dr. McCormick for being with us. Uh, Dr. McCormick, for those of you who are here for the first time, is the Charles Hodge Professor of Systematic Theology at Princeton. And as an American church historian, that title is very meaningful to me. Uh, I'm jealous. I wish I could be the Charles Hodge Professor of something. But I'm glad that you are, and I'm glad we have the Charles Hodge Professor here with us at Trinity. He's going to speak today on the God who reveals himself, the mystery of the Trinity in the New Testament. So please join me in welcoming Dr. McCormick. Doug already knows this, so I'm not really correcting him, but um, I'm not really a church historian. Uh, I'm a historical theologian. Uh, when I went through the History of Doctrine program at Princeton Seminary, church history in those days meant history of ideas. Now it seems to mean nothing more than uh, institutional and social history. It yeah, it does. It does. <laughs> it does. Uh, it's been my, my privilege, one of my great privileges at Princeton Seminary over the years to uh, have occasion to teach New Testament um, back in the 90s. Of course, I always need a New Testament colleague to front for me to get me permission to do this, but um, back in the 90s, I taught Philippians uh, twice with Ulrich Mauser, now retired. And for the last, I don't know, six, seven years, uh, I've been teaching with Beverly Gaventa a course called Paul and Carl. Uh, <laughs> some wag at Princeton said, uh, are we talking about Tillich and Marx? <laughs> No, we're talking about the Apostle and Bart. Uh, the goal of the course is to try to look at Bart's commentary on Romans in the light of current Pauline research and to see how well it's traveled through time and whether people are re really any more receptive to theological exegesis today than they were um, when the book first appeared. And the answer to that question is a very positive one. Yes, they are. Um, it's always a big drawing course. We have a great deal of fun with it. And one of the things I love about it is Beverly and I enjoy a level of trust in each other that enables us to disagree about some important matters that will show up in here um, and still have a great time. <clears throat> so the title of this lecture is The God Who Reveals Himself, The Mystery of the Trinity in the New Testament. And I want to begin with a passage from a sermon whose author I'll identify in a moment. We need not expect that life leads to sitting and possessing. In no sense, at no moment. We cannot remain standing. We may not, and we ought not even once wish to do so. Whatever awaits us on our way is under no circumstances our goal. Even the most important, the beautiful, the tragic moments of our lives are only stations on the way, nothing more. Saying farewell, that is the great rule of this life. Woe to us if we reject this rule, if we want to remain standing, calling a halt, and attaching ourselves to a particular station. There is nothing left for us but to acknowledge this saying farewell, becoming obedient to it, here, we have no lasting city." Unquote. For those accustomed to thinking of Christian life in this world as composed largely of the pursuit of penultimate goals like education, career, and family, whose lives have acquired a settled character marked by rhythms which change but little from year to year, except when transitions are marked by rituals like baptisms, birthday celebrations, high school and college graduations, weddings and funerals. A statement like this one that I just read is bound to seem strange, even alien. The Christian faith does not lead to sitting and possessing. Christian life lays upon us a command, a demand for a continuous act of saying farewell to all the things we most deeply cherish. Surely this is not what most of us signed on for when we became Christians. We wanted an abundant life, 
not a life characterized by departures, by the continuous disruption of whatever order we and our, and our fellows have been able to impose upon this world, by disquiet and unrest and deep longing for a new and different world. And yet, if saying farewell does not characterize our lives, it shows just how far removed we are from the eschatologically conditioned existence of the apostolic writers. You see, <clears throat> eschatology was for them not so much a doctrine as a way of being in the world. The spirit which pervades the New Testament is the spirit of eager expectation, of excitement, of exceeding joy at the prospect of being allowed to live in the turning of the ages and indeed in the last times. It is that spirit which also pervades the passage I read at the outset. The passage comes from a sermon delivered by Karl Barth on the final Sunday of the year 1913. In it, he is quite self-consciously preparing his people for life under the very difficult circumstances which he believes will soon come. He is telling the members of his congregation, basically, who they are in Christ so that they will know how to live out that identity in the days and months ahead. Bart was not alone, of course, in recognizing the signs of cultural and political crisis. Many there were throughout that last year of peace before the outbreak of the Great War who sought to awaken Europe's leaders and its peoples to the abyss on whose edge all were now teetering. Bart was unique, however, in the confident hope which pervaded even his most dire evaluations of the situation. We catch sight of his unshakable confidence in the coming God in the following passage from his 1920 confirmation lessons. And I quote, Homeless in this world, not yet at home in the next, we human beings are wanderers between two worlds. But precisely as wanderers, we are also children of God in Christ. The mystery of our life is God's mystery. Moved by him, we must sigh, be ashamed of ourselves, be shocked, and die. Moved by him, we may be joyful and courageous, hope and live. He is the origin. Therefore, we persist in the movement, and we call, Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Unquote. Over the course of the last two lectures, I carried out a survey of ancient and modern Christian understandings of God. And what I wish to say to you today as we turn to the teaching of the apostles in an effort to assess the value of the views we have examined is that even as the best and brightest minds given by God to the churches throughout the centuries sought basically to mine the New Testament for what it had to teach us about God, they were engaged in a largely unconscious process of separating the beliefs of the apostles from that deeply felt texture of their lived existence so as to make the former, the beliefs, serviceable as building blocks in their own constructive activities. I do not say, of course, that the results were altogether negative. Much that is biblical was preserved in the great systems of thought we have already examined, much that we would have to take with great seriousness. What is missing in virtually all of them is the role played by eschatology in the formulation of New Testament teaching on God, Christ, salvation, etc. The grand exception, of course, is the early Karl Barth. But to miss the eschatological existence of the apostolic writers is to place everything in the wrong light. What Barth said in his second Romans commentary remains true. A Christianity, he wrote, which is not wholly and completely and without remainder eschatology has nothing whatsoever to do with Christ." Unquote. 
Now, if this claim be true, then we find ourselves in a somewhat awkward and certainly a delicate position. We are certainly right to read and interpret Holy Scripture under the guidance of the church. But it must be Scripture which judges the church in the final analysis, not the church Scripture. If that is, we are to remain committed to the Protestant axiom of sola scriptura. And that means that the guidance offered by the church in the reading of Holy Scripture must be subjected to critical scrutiny in the light of a fresh hearing of the word of God. We must not expect that theology leads to sitting and possessing. We are to understand ourselves as caught up in a movement of the exercise of Christ's lordship over the church. It seems to me that the right balance is to follow the confession of one's own church so far as such a thing is authorized and permitted by scripture. But we must not allow that ecclesial authority to exceed its proper bounds. Ecclesial authority must always at the end of the day be subordinated to biblical authority. That the same is true of those modern teachers of the church that people like me prize highly goes without saying. But given the fact that the authority of church teaching can never be anything more than relatively binding, given that its adequacy must always be open to question and must never simply be taken for granted, <coughs> it is at least conceivable that modern theologies might, in some cases at least, stand in a closer relation of fidelity to scripture than do even the most authoritative pronouncements of a church or of the churches seen collectively. <coughs> in this lecture, my intention is to examine New Testament God discourse in order to address a series of questions of great import for systematic theology. How is the God spoken of in the New Testament revealed? And what does this revelation tell us about who and or what God is? What is the relation of Jesus to God? Of the Holy Spirit to Jesus and his Father? Is there an inchoate doctrine of the Trinity in the New Testament? Or does the whole of that church teaching belong more properly to the category of inferences drawn from scriptural teaching? But before I turn more directly to the New Testament witness to the reality of God, I would like to say a few words, a few brief words, about the growing acceptance of, ap of apocalyptic eschatology as basic to the outlook of the New Testament writers. <coughs> So the first major section of this lecture is apocalypticism in the study of the New Testament today. One of the major trends in New Testament research is the study of Paul especially in the light of Jewish apocalyptic literature, both canonical, Daniel, and later Revelation, and extra canonical, for example, 1st Enoch, 2nd Baruch, and 4th Ezra. I'm thinking here primarily, though not exclusively, of the, of the Martin School, a talented group of New Testament scholars who were either colleagues of Lewis Martin at, Lu at Union Seminary in New York or former students trained by him. I'm thinking, for example, of Martin DeBoer, Beverly Gaventa, Raymond Brown, Joel Marcus, Douglas Campbell. A list of allied thinkers would be longer and would include the following. Uh, the Bart of the Romans commentary and Ernst Kazemann would be included as forerunners of this movement. It would also include Paul Meyer and J. Christian Becker. Theologians and ethicists sympathetic to this perspective on reading the New Testament include John Howard Yoder, Douglas Harink, and Nate Kerr. In the hands of most scholars belonging to this movement, Apocalyptic eschatology is not simply a doctrine concerned with the second coming, although it's that too, 
But more fundamentally, it's a way of understanding the whole of God's redemptive activity, both in this world and beyond. In all of its forms, it embraces minimally a two-age theory. That is, the present evil age, as Paul puts it in Galatians 1.4, and an imminent act of God by means of which the powers of sin, evil, and death, which rule over all persons and things in this age, are overthrown and destroyed, and a new age of righteousness and peace is established. New creation and or the kingdom of God are the names for this latter stage in the drama of God's dealings with the world. The Apostle Paul's Christianized version of this understands the new creation as established in principle in the death of Christ and declared in his resurrection from the dead. But Christ's resurrection is at the same time the first fruits of a general resurrection which is still to come according to 1 Corinthians 15 verses 20 and 23. A general resurrection which will set in motion a final universal and public realization and acknowledgement of the judgment which has already been rendered in Christ's death. And so Paul's version of apocalyptic eschatology is even more complex than most, in that new creation itself, the second stage, takes place in two acts rather than simply one, past and future, both having much the same content. And in the interim between the first coming and the second, there has taken place an outpouring of the Holy Spirit to be the apocalyptic eschatological presence and activity of Jesus Christ and thus of God in the lives of believers, individually and communally. Now, there's much to, com <coughs> to commend in this perspective on Paul's theology in particular, though its importance is certainly not limited to Paul. The teachings of the synoptic Jesus especially reflect much the same background in Jewish apocalyptic thinking. And I have to say that I, I agree personally with, with the broad contours of this portrayal. Where I disagree has to do above all with the details of how God is thought to bring an end to sin, evil, and death in the death of Christ. For most advocates of this perspective, God's reconciling work in Christ takes the form of revelation, which, in their view, is the very meaning of the word apocalypse. I would, in a manner more consistent with the later part, turn that relationship around. I think reconciliation is revelation, not the other way around, as it is in Hegel. Revelation is reconciliation. No, I say reconciliation is, re is revelation. I do not believe personally that a revelation which has been abstracted from a consistently forensic understanding of Christ's atoning work can reconcile us to God. God does not reconcile simply by revealing his wrath from heaven, Romans 1, 16 and 17, but by executing it in and upon himself in Jesus Christ, Romans 3, 21 to 26. And however true it may be that the man Jesus had faith and confidence in his Father, the so-called faith of Christ, so much discussed by New Testament scholars today, can never take the place of that faith in Christ which is required of all who would be saved. And finally, rectification, as descriptive of the saving effects of Christ's work, makes a rather poor substitute, poor substitute in my judgment, for justification. It certainly says something of what needs to be said, but not everything. But, on the other hand, Paul does speak rather frequently of this age and its powers, and of a coming age which is already effective in Christ. See, in addition to Galatians 1.4 that I already mentioned, Romans 12.2, 1 Corinthians 1.20 and 2.6 and verse 8, 1 Corinthians 3.18, 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, and Ephesians 1.21. And compare with the phrase, this world, which functions on some occasions as a synonym for this age, in 1 Corinthians 3.19, 5.10, 7.31, and Ephesians 2.2. 2. 
Paul does understand the work of Christ as having cosmic implications in that the rulers of this age are overthrown. He does understand God as acting unilaterally to defeat those enemies. He believes that faith is a condition of salvation which God alone can provide and does so by a monergistic act of the spirit at work in human hearts. Most importantly for our purposes here, Paul understands God as the God who comes to set things right, who invades this world and liberates its captives. So Paul's conception of salvation embraces many of the values of those who would like to say that it is the faith of Christ which saves. I just happen to think there's a lot more to Paul than that. So thus far I've expressed some sympathy with the apocalyptic movement, but not certainly not complete agreement. I mention all this, however, to make the following point, one that is pertinent to the theme of these lectures. When in Romans chapter 1, verses 18 through 20, Paul speaks of a natural revelation, quote unquote, he does not do so in my judgment in order to license a speculative theology which would seek to build up an understanding of God's being and attributes on a basis laid in cosmology. He's simply explaining why the wrath of God, has come upon the God that, that has come upon the godless has been deserved. Why that is, they are without excuse. Speculative theology is in fact the product of a much more settled situation in the life of the church when theologians had, or at least thought they had, the luxury of time to think about deep matters. But all of that lies very far from Paul's situation as a theologian of God's apocalypse. He does not need to be taught the evils of so-called ontotheology in order to avoid engagement in it. It simply doesn't occur to him to go there. His thinking is completely absorbed by the imminence of Christ's return. See, for example, Philippians chapter 3, verses 1 through 11. That is what gives to his missionary activity an urgency, which leaves him no time for abstract thinking or reflection. We will need to keep that in mind as I now turn to the God of the New Testament writers. <coughs> Roman numeral two, the God proclaimed by the apostles. The New Testament writers, to a person, understood themselves to worship the one God of Israel, and to that extent as standing in a relation of continuity with Old Testament faith. See especially Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. But equally, they believe this God to have revealed himself in a new and definitive way. Jesus of Nazareth, a human being, was now understood to belong to the identity of the one God of Israel. What we find in the New Testament is most certainly monotheism but it is what Larry Hurtado calls a Christologically shaped monotheism. A monotheism that includes the man Jesus in itself so that worship of the one true God was now understood to require and take place through the worship of Jesus as Lord. Thus, God discourse in the New Testament is Christologically determined. There is little if any interest in the so-called being of God. Passages like 1 Timothy 6.16, 6, which says of God that he, quote, has immortality and dwells in unapproachable light, are exceptional. It is soteriology and eschatology which animate the New Testament writers. They do not address ontological questions directly, and most certainly have no interest in a metaphysical way of answering those questions. Their attention is absorbed by what God had done in their midst in the person of Jesus of Nazareth. And so Hurtado is right to say, and I quote, theologizing about God in the New Testament is essentially making inferences based on God's acts. Consequently, there is scarcely anything in the New Testament that amounts to metaphysics other than the conviction that God exceeds the powers of human reason. There is certainly no attempt in the New Testament to portray God unto himself or this deity's inner life, so to speak. 
Moreover, the actions of this God are not primarily the disclosure of information about God in the service of theological speculation or mystical contemplation, unquote. What is revealed are God's purposes in and through his redemptive activity in Christ, and with that, his relational and moral attributes of love, faithfulness, righteousness, mercy, and grace. The great apocalypse, the event of self-disclosure which effected a deepening and elevation in the apostolic understanding of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, so that this God would henceforth be known even more intimately as the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, was, of course, the bodily resurrection of Jesus. According to the uniform testimony of the New Testament, the resurrection was not the resuscitation of a corpse, but the bestowal upon Jesus of that life which is proper to the coming world, the new world, which will replace the old world that is passing away. The resurrection was thus understood as an eschatological event, as the eruption into this world of the powers of the age to come. Precisely as such, it was also a definitive disclosure of the nature of the, the one true God. The God who vindicates both himself and Jesus in the resurrection and exalts Jesus to a position of honor and authority is the father of a son who is utterly unique in kind. Jesus is referred to as the Son. See John 5, 18 through 24, and compare with that Romans 1, 3, chapter 8, verses 29 and 32, 1 Corinthians 15, 28, Galatians chapter 4, verses 4 through 6, 1 Thessalonians 1, 10. And it's only through adoption into his filial relation to the Father Romans 8, 15, and 23, that the Father becomes our Father too, and we become his children. But if the resurrection of Jesus is the definitive disclosure of divine identity, it is also the definitive disclosure of the divine purposes. If God has confirmed through the resurrection that the death of Jesus is indeed the redemption of the world, if God's purposes are now seen to have a universal horizon of intentionality, then all of God's previous activities must now be seen in the light of what God has done in Jesus Christ. A retrospective reconfiguration of traditional materials now takes place in an effort to honor the fact that Jesus belongs to the divine identity. The concept of election, for example, is no longer made to refer to God's this-worldly act of choosing a people for himself or selecting kings and priests to serve that people. The language of before the foundations of the world now comes into play. Those who believe in Christ are those who were chosen in him before the foundation of the world. That is to say, when as yet there was no world, Ephesians 1.4. Consistent with this perspective, Jesus refers to himself in his high priestly prayer in John 17 as the object of God's love before the foundation of the world, 1724. In a similar way, Jesus is referred in 1 Peter 1.20 as destined before the foundation of the world but revealed at the end of the ages. According to Matthew's gospel, the kingdom of God was prepared for those who place their faith in Christ from the foundation of the world in 2534. And John the seer speaks of the end of those whose names are not inscribed in the Lamb's Book of Life from the foundation of the world in 313.8 and 17.8, thus implying the existence of an elect whose names are so inscribed, again, from the foundation of the world. Not only election, but creation too is reconfigured in the minds of the apostolic writers by God's identification with Jesus in the resurrection. Paul puts it this way, for us there is one God, the Father, from whom are all things and for whom we exist, and one Lord Jesus Christ through whom are all things and through whom we exist, 1 Corinthians 8, 6. <clears throat> 
Likewise, in Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 to 17, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For in him all things in heaven and on earth were created, things visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or powers, all things have been created through him and for him. He himself is before all things, and in him all things hold together." Unquote. Who is the he of whom these things are said in Colossians 1? The Son, of verse 13, to be sure. But the Son is made to be synonymous with Christ Jesus in verse 4, and with Christ in verse 7. The one through whom all things were made is not, according to Colossians 1, an eternal son in the abstract. That is to say, abstracted from that identity which is his through the assumption of flesh. On the contrary, he is already precisely as the one through whom all things were made, named Christ Jesus. <coughs> So the outcome is the same as in 1 Corinthians 8, 6. Or consider Hebrews 1, 2. The one through whom God created the worlds is identified with the Son through whom God has spoken in these last days, in verse 1. The Son who made purification for sins and sat down at the right hand of God, in verse 3. Now, none of these last mentioned activities, purification, session at the right hand of the Father were performed by a Lagos Asarkas, but clearly by Jesus Christ. And unless a shift in grammatical subject is alleged to have taken place between verse 1 and verse 3, in which Jesus Christ is clearly the acting subject, then Jesus Christ is the medium of creation in verse 2 as well. John 1 makes the very same equation through the words of John the Baptist who says of the word made flesh, he who comes after me ranks ahead of me because he was before me. He who comes after me ranks ahead of me because he was before me, 115. Thus identifying the word made flesh of verse 14 with the word through whom all things were made in verse three. Hurtado puts the matter quite bluntly, but I think accurately. What such statements amount to is, quote, a rather direct personal identity of the human Jesus and the divine agent of creation, unquote. But how can Jesus Christ, the God human, be the subject or agent of an activity performed prior to being born in this world? In what sense is that meant? I will return to this problem, which is deeply ontological in its import, in a moment. Suffice it here to say that it is Jesus Christ and not an indeterminate logos a sarkos through whom all things are made. Thus giving further weight to the claim that God discourse in the New Testament is consistently grounded in Christology. <coughs> in sum, the earliest Christians certainly understood themselves to be worshipers of the one true God of Israel. At the same time, however, there can be little question but, they, but that they subjected the received understanding of God to a considerable expansion, deepening, and even alteration. Oneness, for example, could no longer possess quite the same meaning when the identity of the one God includes in itself the man Jesus. And this did cause controversy with a fair number of their Jewish neighbors who could be forgiven for wondering whether the Christian God was still the Jewish God at all. turning then to the problem of the Trinity in the New Testament, subheading three. <coughs> Major heading three. There is no doctrine of the Trinity in the New Testament if by that is meant a careful articulation of the unity and differentiation of the eternal being of God. Nevertheless, it is true to say that the problem to which the later Orthodox doctrine of the Trinity provided an answer was seen by the New Testament writers, at least in rudimentary form. <clears throat> For Paul, the problem often 
takes a Benetarian form having to do with the inclusion of Jesus in the identity of God. It is above all John who sees the problem in its fully Trinitarian dimensions. Unlike Paul, he makes the distinction between the advocate who will come when Jesus goes to his father to be a clear distinction of personal agencies in the farewell discourses in chapters 14 to 16. Paul, on the other hand, had a tendency to elide this distinction, seeing in the spirit something like the spiritual presence of the risen Christ subsequent to his ascension. See, for example, 2 Corinthians 3.17, where Paul writes, Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. What I would like to do here is to consider the problem of the Trinity in the New Testament from the standpoint, first, of the Son's equality with and his subordination to the Father. I will then turn to the testimony of the New Testament writers to the reality of the Spirit, seeking to understand his relation to both Father and especially the Son. So I begin, point A, with the deity of Christ. In the writings of Paul especially, unity and difference in God is specified concretely in terms of what I want to call a dialectic between equality and subordination. These are not his terms, they are mine but they do get at something rather basic to his thinking. Since the meaning of each of these terms is conditioned by the other, neither can be used in a normal sense. We begin then with equality, which is a function of the deity of Christ. A good place to begin is with the so-called Christ hymn in Philippians chapter 2, verses 6 through 11. <coughs> Whether this is a hymn or not, whether Paul wrote it or not, it certainly expresses Paul's theology, and that's all that finally matters. A number of scholars believe that Paul has here adapted for his own use a hymn that was in use in early congregational worship, which would indicate that the theology it contains is very early, and that's the most important point. The passage is well known, but it would perhaps be well if we had the whole of it before us. I'm going to start with verses 3 through 5 since they provide the motivation for referring to the hymn. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility regard, your, regard others as better than yourselves. Let each of you look not to your own interests, but to the interests of others. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. Now verse 6 who though, or it may be because, he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness. And being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. <clears throat> Therefore God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father." Unquote. In classical exegesis of this passage, right on up through the 19th century, the, int the attention of interpreters was absorbed by the question of the identity of the subject who performs the act of self-emptying, and, depending on the answer given to that question, what the meaning of self-emptying, or kenosis, might be. Who's the subject, and what is kenosis? In the 20th century, attention has focused more closely on the exaltation of verses 9 through 11, and the question of what this exaltation might mean for the deity of, Christ, of Jesus Christ. The two sets of questions are obviously related. The answer given to one will impact the answer given to the other. My interest here lies in the exaltation since it is that element which testifies most force, forcibly to the deity of Jesus. I'm going to come back in my lecture on Christology to the first stanza of this so-called hymn on Monday. The subject of the exaltation is clearly the Christ Jesus spoken of in verse 5. 
who was raised from the dead by his father and then exalted. The decisive feature of this stanza of the hymn, in my view, lies in its application of Isaiah 45, 23 to Jesus Christ. In Isaiah, it is the Lord of hosts who says of himself, to me, every knee shall bow, every tongue shall swear. Paul gives to the passage its original sense when he cites it in Romans 14, 11. But here, it is at the name of Jesus that every knee should bend. And the reason given is that God himself has given Jesus the name which is above every name. I think Richard Baucom and, Harry and Larry Hurtado are absolutely right to insist that the name above all names is the name which God gave to himself in Exodus chapter 3, verses 14 and 15. The name so sacred to the Jews that they would not take it upon their lips. It is this name which is now given, quote unquote, to Jesus. The crucial point to be made here is this. If a human being is rightly worshipped as God, it can only be because God has become a human being. Or, even more accurately, in order not to exceed the limits of Paul's language here, God has so identified himself with Jesus in raising him from the dead that it is now seen for the first time that a human being belongs to the identity of the Lord of hosts. The only remaining question is, does Jesus attain this status only at the point at which he is exalted? Does he only begin to share in the identity of the one God of Israel at that point? Or was this true all along? Is the giving of the name a constitutive act, one which constitutes God as God, or is it simply a definitive revelation of something that was true all along? I think myself that the answer lies on the side of definitive revelation. That, it seems to me, is what Paul also means in Romans chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, when he says of the gospel that it concerns God's quote, son who was descended from David according to the flesh and was declared to be son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord, unquote. But we move too quickly past the problem posed for the doctrine of the Trinity by Philippians 2.9 if we fail to recognize that the name of God is being given to the man Jesus. And so even if we would like to say that this is definitive disclosure and not a constitutive act, we must still take seriously the fact that what is revealed is an eternal truth about Jesus, not the revelation of an abstract logos, a sarkos. Not a, revel a revelation of a logos, a sarkos abstracted from his identification with Jesus. And that, finally, is the answer posed to the question of the subject of the act of self-emptying referred to in verse 7. The subject is Christ Jesus, as is already made clear in verse 5. Not only does Paul not have a logos concept, you can only find that in John, Paul does not even know anything of an eternal son as such. The second person of the Trinity if I may be allowed an anachronism to speak of Paul's understanding of God, the second person of the Trinity is Christ Jesus. The Son for him is for him, Christ Jesus, and Christ Jesus is the Son. Is then self-emptying a precondition of some sort for incarnation? Or does it take place in this world, in the lived existence of Jesus, in his way of being which led to the cross? Cyril of Alexandria, Augustine and Thomas, writing in the aftermath of the Nicene-Constantinopolitan resolution of fourth century debates over the Trinity, held to the first alternative. Luther and Calvin held to the second. Both of these alternatives have much to commend them. <clears throat> the emptying certainly seems to be given a priority over taking the form of a slave which suggests that the act of self-emptying is either identical with the assumptio carnis, 
or it is an internal act which precedes the assumption. <coughs> Either way, the subject of the self-emptying pre-exists the incarnation. A view which is fully in line with Paul's affirmation of the pre-existence of Christ elsewhere. See especially 1 Corinthians 8, 4 through 6, which we already mentioned in relation to creation, and other passages of the same kind. The second alternative has, has in its favor the fact that the setting of the hymn is found in Paranasus. Paul is exhorting us to have the same mind in ourselves as, we, as was in Christ, a mind which is revealed in humility and obedience. If we wish to say, and I think we should, that it is the pre-existent Christ Jesus who emptied himself, then we should add that this self-emptying bears visible fruit in the way of Jesus to the cross, a way which we are to emulate. But neither of these historical alternatives does full justice to the fact that Paul identifies the pre-existent subject who empties himself with Christ Jesus. The ancient reading retains pre-existence, but it does so only by distinguishing the logos carefully from the flesh he assumes. But that's not what Paul says. It is Christ Jesus who empties himself. Taking a step back, it seems to me that there are two general ways in which the pre-existence of Christ Jesus might be understood. The first is to say that he pre-exists his coming into this world only in the mind of God, which is to say only in the eternal divine purposes. He's foreordained by God and therefore also foreknown. The second option would be to say that Christ Jesus belongs to the divine reality objectively before anything else was brought into existence. How one can say this meaningfully is the Trinitarian problem bequeathed to us by Paul. In any event, Paul understands Jesus to belong to the identity of the one God of Israel. As such, Jesus is deserving of the same reverence and honor which is owed to God. Indeed, the worship of the one God is at the same time the worship of Jesus. The equality of the Father and the Son when seen in this light is not the stuff of metaphysical reflection, but of worship. Father and Son are worshiped equally as God. But an equality so understood is not inconsistent with a strong measure of subordination. In the aftermath of the Nicene-Constantinopolitan settlement, it became common to consign the subordination evidenced in Jesus' obedience to the will of the Father who sent him into this world to the economy, so as to leave room for a quite different conception of the eternal relation of Father and Son. The metaphysical gap opened up by this way of distinguishing the economic and imminent trinity was then softened by a rather free, which is to say arbitrary, use of the concept of analogy. The economic trinity was said to be analogically related to the imminent trinity so that we are justified in claiming that the former reveals or manifests the latter. Such manifestation, manifestation it was asserted, is real even if not exhaustive. And in this way, subordination in the imminent life of the triune God was completely eliminated. To the extent that Paul thinks of the imminent life of God at all, there is most certainly subordination in it. To be the medium of God's creative activity, for example, is implied by the distinction in 1 Corinthians 8, 6 between all things being from the Father and through the Lord Jesus Christ, which contains in itself an element of subordination. And again, it is Jesus Christ that is said to be the medium of creation so that the subordination granted by the tradition to the economy is read by Paul back into pre-existence, however that concept is interpreted. Even more important, however, is Paul's understanding of the consummation of all things. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 24 through 28, Paul writes, And when all things are subjected to him, to Jesus Christ, the Son himself will also be subjected to the one who put all things in subjection under him, so that God may be all in all. 
The picture presented here is one of a post-temporal eternal relation. The final judgment has taken place. Christ has put all enemies under his feet, including death, the last enemy, according to verses 25 and 26. And now Christ takes his place of honor next to the Father, we might say. But still, he remains in subjection to the one who placed all things in subjection to him. As I suggested earlier, such an understanding is not inconsistent with a conception of equality that takes rise in the realm of worship. It is one work of God that has been carried out by God in Christ. It is one God who has carried it out. The worship due to God must include worship of Jesus Christ, or it is not this God who is being worshipped. Beyond that, Paul does not take us. Now, we might be inclined to think, okay, but that's only Paul. It's Paul when read in isolation, in a non-canonical manner. But what happens when we read Paul together with other New Testament writers? Above all, with John's Gospel. My own view is that even John provides us with no clear foundation for the metaphysical understanding of the imminent trinity, which the early church constructed with so much care and after many hiccups. It's also a long, very long way from Paul to Hegel, of course, not just chronologically, but conceptually. In fact, Hegel has, has to presuppose the at least formal validity of that unity and differentiation on the level of divine being which was sponsored by the early church in order to get his own project off the ground. <coughs> so criticism of Constantinople must inevitably result in criticism of Hegel as well. <coughs> this is not at all to say, however, that a doctrine of the imminent trinity is an impossibility. And I mean by that a doctrine of the imminent trinity in protology. Far from it. I think it's possible to construct an understanding of the imminent trinity that maintains closer contact with the New Testament, and I'm going to provide that in my sixth lecture. It is simply to say that the use of metaphysics, whether ancient or modern, will always result in a distancing from the concentration of the New Testament writers on divine activities. John is really no exception to this claim. A dialectic of equality and subordination similar to that found in Paul is also present in John's Gospel. Because for John, too, the Son simply is Jesus Christ. The Logos who is introduced in the prologue disappears from view once he has been identified with Jesus in 114. From that point on, the Logos is of no interest. It is, in fact, Jesus who says that his hour has come and prays to the Father that the Father might glorify him in 17.1. It is Jesus who was sent by the Father, 17.3. He who shared the Father's glory before the world was, in 17.5. Jesus who celebrates an equality with the Father, which consists in the fact that all who are his also belong to the Father, in 17.10. Jesus to whom the Father has given his name, in 17.11. Jesus who is not of this world, in 17.14 and 16. Jesus, who says that he is in the Father and the Father is in him, in 1721. And it is he who is confessed as true God by Thomas after, notice, touching the wounds in his body, in 2028. Taken together, what these passages indicate is not only that the eternal Son is somehow manifested in and through Jesus Christ, but that Jesus Christ simply is the eternal Son, the one who came into this world and has now returned to his Father. And so, not surprisingly, it is also Jesus Christ who says in 1031, the Father and I are one. Though this statement has often been read metaphysically as the expression of a oneness of being, the context makes it quite clear that it is a unity of purpose and activity which is in view. Here, as in 1710, the equality of Jesus Christ with his Father is made to consist in the fact that all that the Father has, he has freely given to the Son. But here, that which is given to the Son is specified, and it consists in the elect, not in some metaphysically de defined divine attributes. 
I quote, no one will snatch them out of my hand, 1028. And the reason given is that no one can snatch those the Father has given them, him, out of the Father's hand, 1029. In other words, to be in the Son's hand and to be in the Father's hand is to be under the very same power and authority. What John does not provide us with is a picture of a final eschatological restoration of an original equality in being of Father and Son. And so the I am sayings do most certainly give evidence that Jesus Christ belongs to the identity of the one God of Israel. They do most certainly give expression to the idea of pre-existence. But in John, as in Paul, the idea of pre-existence is not given definite content. Certainly it is not metaphysically specified. The theme of subordination in John's gospel is entirely congruent with the kind of equality which John affirms. Jesus says in John's Gospel, for example, I can do nothing of my own. As I hear, I judge. And my judgment is just because I seek to do not my own will, but the will of him who sent me. In the Christian tradition after Constantinople, it has been common to make a distinction here between a subordination on the level of willed activity and an ongoing equality of shared substance metaphysically conceived. But the gospel makes no use of the latter concept. As we have seen, all that the Father gives to the Son is not a metaphysical giving, but a statement of shared redemptive activity leading to shared worship. It is for this reason that Jesus can also say, the Father is greater than I. The Father has a priority in the giving, but he is worshiped together with Jesus Christ as one God. I mentioned earlier that John alone in the New Testament sees the Trinitarian dimensions of the mystery of divine reality in their fullness. What is important for our purposes here is to note that John understands the Spirit as subordinated to the Son even as the Son is subordinated to the Father. The Spirit appears in the farewell discourse as the advocate of the ascended Jesus. Crucial here is the fact that the Spirit brings no new revelation as James Montgomery Boyce rightly argued long ago in his Basel dissertation. But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you everything and remind you of all that I have said to you, 1426. When the Advocate comes, whom I will send you from the Father, he will testify on my behalf, 1526. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own, but will speak whatever he hears, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, because he will take what is mine and declare it to you. 16, 13, and 14. The ministry of the spirit in the Christian community is a ministry of witness to Jesus Christ. He reveals not himself, but Jesus. There's more to the Spirit's ministry, above all to us, but also to Jesus himself than John sets forth here. So the time has come to turn to a slightly fuller treatment of the reality of the Spirit, the significance of his outpouring, and what I am going to call the duality of his relation to Jesus Christ. subheading B, the Holy Spirit as the power of the future. In Peter's sermon on the day of Pentecost, recorded in Acts 2, he makes the claim that what happened on that day is the fulfillment of the prophecy found in Joel 2. There we read, in the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters will prophesy, and your men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even upon my slaves, both men and women, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show portents in heaven above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and smoky mist. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the Lord's great and glorious day. 
Then everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Acts chapter 2, 17 to 21. The Holy Spirit is the eschatological spirit, the power of the future already effective here and now in believers, and before them in Christ himself. Compare Acts 2, 33. Those hearing this message are thereby assured that they are indeed living in the last days. Thus, in shifting our attention from the relation of the Son to the Father, from the, excuse me, from, from, in shifting our attention from the relation of the Son to the Father to the relation of the Spirit to both Jesus Christ and His Father, we are now more clearly placing the whole of the material treated to this point in my lecture into its proper eschatological frame of reference. The Holy Spirit poured forth into the hearts of believers is a first installment on the eschatological transformation which all will undergo when Christ returns. 2 Corinthians 1, 22, 5, 5, Ephesians 1, 13, and 14. Even now the Spirit is the, is the power of God by means of which men and women are given faith in Christ, according to 1 Thessalonians 2, 13. Adopted into his relation to the Father, according to Romans 8, 15, and enabled to live lives that are pleasing to God, according to Romans 8, 4 through 17. The Holy Spirit is very closely associated with the so-called powers of the age to come in Hebrews 6, 4 and 5. And indeed, the Spirit is himself the power by means of which gifts, charismata, are given for the upbuilding of that community, which looks forward in eager anticipation of and is even now preparing itself for the return of the Lord in 1 Corinthians 12, 1 through 11. In short, wherever the Spirit is spoken of, their power to convict, convince, and live into the righteousness of God is in play. Indeed, Paul's message is confirmed as being from God by the signs and wonders which are even then being performed by the Spirit at work in and through him. Romans 15, 18 and 19, 1 Corinthians 2, 1 through 5. But it's not the Spirit's ministry in the eschatological community which is my chief interest here. It is rather the Spirit's ministry in the life of Jesus. Jesus is conceived by the Holy Spirit. It is the Spirit who effects the union of the Son of God with human flesh, Matthew 1.20 and Luke 1.35. The Spirit descends upon him visibly in his baptism at the Jordan River, in order to equip him for the battles which lie ahead. Matthew 3.16, Mark 1.10 and 11, Luke 3.22. In all three of the Synoptic Gospels, the equipping of Jesus with power to carry out his messianic office is immediately followed by his temptation. The Spirit leads Jesus into the wilderness to do battle in enemy-occupied territory, as Sinclair Ferguson rather nicely says. Mark puts it even more forcibly. The Spirit drove him to go out into the wilderness. The verb employed here in Mark 1.12 is ekbale, the same one used in 134 to speak of Jesus casting out demons. It is the Spirit who, in and through Jesus, does battle with the powers which rule over the present age. It is the Spirit who, in and through Jesus, um, casts out demons, a sign that the kingdom of God is present in Jesus' person and work, according to Matthew 12, 28 and Luke eleven twenty. The ministry of the Spirit to the man Jesus constitutes a guarantee that he is the eschatological Adam who has come into this world to reclaim a world which was lost and is rightfully God's. Now I could continue on to treat the role of the Holy Spirit in the passion and death of Jesus and the fact that it is the Spirit as the eschatological power of God which raised Jesus from the dead. Even when in some passages it is the Father who is said to be the author of the resurrection, we can think of Acts 2.32, 17.31, Romans 8.11, 1 Corinthians 15.15, 15. and in others, other passages, that the Son will raise himself, John 2.19-21, chapter 10, 17, and 18. 
At the end of the day, it's the Spirit who is the effective power of both Father and Son in this world. And the Spirit, therefore, raises Jesus into an eternal life in which there is no more death. See Romans 1, 4, 8, 11. 1 Peter 3.18. But what we have seen to this point is sufficient to raise an important question with profound Christological import. The answer given to it also has implications for the doctrine of the Trinity. The question is this. If the bishops at Chalcedon were right in identifying the person of the union of the two natures with the eternal Logos as such, then why is it necessary for Jesus to be equipped with the power of the Holy Spirit in his baptism? And how does it come about that he is driven into the wilderness, not by a Logos acting through or upon his human nature, but by the third person of the Trinity? If it is the case that an omnipotent person of the Trinity, the Logos, is the subject of all that is done in and through his human nature, what need would he have for further spiritual endowment. Or looked at from the opposite direction, if it is indeed the case that in his baptism Jesus stood, to quote Sinclair Ferguson, in need of a fresh and greater endowment of the Spirit, unquote, in order to carry out his messianic office, then does it make any sense to think of the Logos as, as powerfully acting through and even upon his human nature? It will not do, it seems to me, in an effort to answer this question, to appeal to the principle of inseparable operations, for, for we are asking here about what the tradition called appropriations. If the work of the man Jesus is so clearly appropriated to the Holy Spirit by the New Testament writers, by what justification then do the fathers appropriate this work to the Logos instead? It would seem to me that the only path left open to us in an effort to resolve these difficulties would have to lie through a renewed concentration on the problem of kenosis referred to in Philippians 2.7. It is that concept which alone, in my view, is capable of generating a fully coherent and well-integrated answer to these questions. I'll return to this problem in the next lecture. Let me just say in anticipation of that, just so you don't get confused, because some of you are only here once, and uh, you could get confused. I'm not saying there's no such thing as the hypostatic union. I'm not suggesting that the Logos is, is not hypostatically united to Jesus. What I am suggesting is the image of the Logos acting through and upon Jesus renders the work of the Spirit in Jesus' life superfluous to requirements. We wouldn't need the Spirit. It doesn't make any sense. If the Spirit is indeed the power by which he does the work that he does, his miracles, his works of love, then the relation of the Logos to Jesus needs to be understood differently than the way the early fathers understood it. We have to rethink the directionality of hypostatic union. Okay, that's for next week. One last line of reflection, and we are finished with our survey of New Testament teaching on God. The Jesus witnessed to by the New Testament writers is not only radically dependent upon the Holy Spirit for the fulfillment of his messianic office, he's also the one who baptizes in or gives the Spirit, which suggests a certain priority on the part of the Son vis-a-vis -vis the Spirit. John the Baptist compares his own ministry with that of the one who comes after him in the following words. I baptize you with water for repentance, but one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to carry his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor and will gather his wheat into the granary, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. Matthew 3, 11 and 12. Compare Luke 3, 15 through 17. We note in passing that here too the Holy Spirit appears as the eschatological power of purgation in the case of some and destruction in the case of others, which also testifies to the eschatological character of Christ's own work. But my point in this context is that it is Jesus who gives the Holy Spirit. That point is reiterated in Acts 2, 32 and 33, where we read again from Peter's Pentecost sermon, This Jesus God raised up, 
and of that all of us are witnesses. Being therefore exalted at the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this that you both see and hear today. Unquote. John has an even more precise formulation, as we might expect from one who saw the Trinitarian problem most clearly. He says, when the advocate comes whom I will send to you from the Father, the spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, whom I will send, who proceeds from the Father, he will testify on my behalf, John 15, 26. Now this is the only passage in the New Testament which employs a term which would play a sizable role in subsequent Trinitarian reflection. That word is proceeds. And in later centuries, the church would be divided over the issue of whether the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father alone or from the Father and the Son. I will only say here in, that in the context of John's Gospel, Jesus clearly participates in the sending of the Spirit. And that is that it is doubtful that any distinction can be made between processions and missions on the basis of this particular text. John tells us that Jesus breathed the Spirit upon his disciples in chapter 20, verse 22. Whether this act of giving in 2022 is to be regarded as symbolic, as some, something done in anticipation, perhaps, of the day of Pentecost or not, it's clearly Jesus, according to John, who bestows the Spirit. Now, all of this suggests a duality in the relation of Jesus Christ to the Holy Spirit. On the one hand, Jesus Christ has a decided priority. It is he who sends the Spirit to be his witness, to serve him in the role of advocacy. On the other hand, his obedience unto death is unthinkable apart from the empowerment he receives in the gift of the Spirit which he himself received in his baptism. So how are we to think these two lines together? It seems to me that what we have before us is one of the strongest arguments which can be found in the New Testament for the logic, if not the precise categories, of the Chalcedonian Two Natures Christology. Many New Testament scholars have pointed out that there's no absolutely incontrovertible attestation of Jesus' deity in Paul's theology, not even in Romans 1.4 or 9.5. The language and syntax employed in each of these passages leaves room for debate. With John, however, it is otherwise in my view. The confession of Thomas to the deity of Christ in 2028, combined with the clear identification of the word with God in 1.1, seems to me to lead to the conclusion that Jesus Christ is God, not simply divine, whatever that might mean, but God in the flesh, though that conclusion, too, has been challenged from time to time. But if the relation of Jesus Christ to the Holy Spirit is, on the one hand, that of a sovereign sending, and on the other hand, that of a radical dependence, then it would seem to be, to me, that there is more to the identity of Jesus Christ than simply the man Jesus as such. It would seem that he is both a divine person and a human person at the same time. For he sends the Spirit as a divine act, and he receives the Spirit as a human act. And if one then combines this train of thought with the idea of an eternal election for precisely this outcome, then you have a strong rationale for something closely akin to a two-natures Christology. Conclusion. New Testament writers lived in a more rarefied atmosphere than we do. They breathed an air so thin that we would gasp should we try to, w to live in it. That is why we come to it for the most part as visitors, well equipped with oxygen tanks so that we remain unaffected while we go about the business of carving bits and pieces of their teachings out in order to make them building blocks in systems of thought that must finally remain alien to them. To put the matter less colloquially, the New Testament is shot through with eschatology. A de-eschatologized doctrine of God is possible only by stripping away the ethos which permeated New Testament teaching. What all this adds up to is this. That understanding of God will be most faithful to the New Testament and to the Protestant axiom of sola scriptura, which leaves metaphysics behind. I would like to conclude with three principles which I think should govern constructive work on the doctrine of God after metaphysics. 
I believe them all to be commensurate with the material treated in this lecture. First, all thinking about the triune God must begin where the apostolic writers themselves began, namely with the so-called divine missions. The New Testament writers knew nothing of divine processions abstracted from those missions. That's not to say that sound meaning cannot be given to the idea of processions. The idea of processions does find some more in the New Testament, however slender it may be, in John 1.18 and 1526. It is only to say that we need to be very, very careful with regard to the content we assign to the word processions. If that content should differ from that of the missions in any way, there we are working with ideas borrowed from natural theology. Second, we need to stop trying to eliminate every last vestige of subordination from the doctrine of the Trinity. A doctrine of the Trinity which would suppress the element of subordination found in Paul's writings especially will inevitably be guilty of myth-making. That is, the construction of a conception of the triune God which has lost contact with the biblical witness and now is engaged in arbitrary speculation. This is not, however, as I insisted in my opening lecture, to endorse subordinationism, as it was understood in the early church. The subordinationism rejected by the early church would require a hierarchical relating of three distinct divine individuals, each equipped with his own mind, will, and energy of operation. If this is to be avoided, and the element of subordination found in Paul's theology is to be honored at the same time, then the persons of the Godhead must be regarded as differing modes of being of a single divine subject. Third, and this is a corollary of my first point, in reversing the order of reflection found in the early church so as to move from Christology to Trinity to God's being and attributes, modern theologians have also succeeded in making theology more responsible to Holy Scripture. The Trinity is not the first thing. The New Testament writers proclaimed Christ crucified, not a doctrine of the Trinity. But that then means that Christology has an absolutely fundamental significance. If we would be faithful to the New Testament, we must do what the writers of it did and make Christology basic to our reflections on God. Which Christology we employ is the truly decisive question to be addressed in any Christian dogmatics. If it is to be, to be responsive to the trajectories of New Testament teaching, it will have to be a pneumatologically driven Christology, which does justice to the humility and obedience which were constitutive of Jesus' way to the cross. And that will be the subject of my next lecture. Thank you very much. to this point. Bruce, the first lecture, you criticized contemporary, especially contemporary evangelical theology, uh, among other things, for being too tied to classical views of God, and I would probably add classical Christology. You criticized that, and me in particular. And what I heard that night was actually just a statement of disagreement. I didn't actually hear an argument that that's a bad thing. Now, you you what you said yeah. was then the next day we yeah. would hear an argument against simplicity and, and impassibility in particular. And I must say that I heard a lot of interesting historical narrative yesterday. I didn't hear an argument. I did hear, unless, except insofar as certain modern thinkers have pulled the rug out from under classical metaphysics, in which case then that renders the classical doctrine of God wrong. But for those of us who say, agree with Nick Walterstorff that it's, it's possible and desirable to recover from Kant. You know, Kant's not a terminal disease, as he says. Um, maybe we think Kant didn't really do all that. So for those of us who feel that way and are persuaded such, I didn't really hear an argument there either, other than in historical sense. So I was well, thinking today is where we're going to get it. Tom, let's just talk about today for, for starters. What well, you well, heard, that's where I'm at. What you, what you heard me do in this lecture was give you considerable exegesis 
to demonstrate that in passage after passage, the writers are not doing metaphysics. Oh, I'm not here to suggest now, that they are. Yeah, but, but you just said to me, I don't have an argument. I no, I said doing, I didn't hear one. I have been doing nothing but argue since I got here. I didn't say you didn't have one. I said I didn't hear one. But today I thought, well, I'll hear one, and I think I did. I think it amounted to this, Bruce, so far as I can tell, at least a big part of it. The identification of the incarnate Christ Jesus with the Son of God undermines the classical view of God and classical Christology. And you made a case for that. That's a large piece of it. Yeah, a big, but not the only thing you said. Yeah. But let's just talk about that. I mean, I want you to respond to, to this on that point, if you don't mind. Mm -hmm. Because what I heard sounded to me like a lot of um, really insightful biblical study, uh, engaging with some good biblical scholars. Mm -hmm. But I heard, what I heard, I think, is just a confusion, frankly, of identification with identity. And N.T. N.T. Wright and, and Roy Hoover, actually, in their discussions, respective discussions of Philippians 2, they actually raised this very consideration. So Wright says, for instance, he says, when we say that the queen is a schoolgirl, or we don't mean she was the queen as a schoolgirl, we mean the person who is the queen was a schoolgirl. There's no identification. There's an, in the strict, there's, there is identification, but there's no strict sense of identity there. And it Tom, seems to me that there's plenty of room for classical Christology to continue, but I'm sure you have plenty to say, so go ahead. Well, well Tom, you're giving a lecture. You're not asking a question. Well, here's the question. <laughs> so what do you think of all that? <laughs> <laughs> Listen, um, <coughs> I don't even know where to begin. When you, when you give a lecture, and it's full of footnotes, and you document in New Testament literature each of the moves you make, and you listen to it, you don't have that in front of you. So then you throw N.T. Wright at me. I don't happen to agree with him. I think identification is itself an act with ontological significance. For example, I see, I, Don, I agree Carson, with that. I see Don Carson sitting in the back. Mm -hmm. I love Don Carson's interpretation of participation in Christ. Now, a lot of theologians today make a meal out of the preposition in. They want to turn it into something evangelical Catholic, I don't know. In Don's work, he shows very carefully that being in Christ means that we are so completely identified with him because he's so completely identified himself with us that we are surrendered to him, that we have no identity apart from this surrender to him. And we live in conformity to him. I, identification is not an empty concept. It's I, full of ontological I, significance. I, I don't so, deny that a bit. That's where we get the doctrine of the Trinity is because this identification pushes us that way. So when I push the identity of Jesus as belonging to the God of Israel, on the basis of somebody like Bauckham's exegesis mm -hmm. of Philippians 2. I am doing ontology. I'm just not doing it metaphysically. I'm doing it on the basis of a very careful uh, exegesis of the biblical witness to Jesus Christ. I'm basing it Christologically, not metaphysically. Your footnotes are full of the exegesis. I'm not challenging the exegesis. My question has to do with the move from exegesis to theological conclusion. And that's where I keep at wondering, how does this exactly rule out classical Christology which you need to rule out to rule out classical doctrine of God. Because, as I showed yesterday, the understanding of, of God in, embraced in classical theism has its origins in a process of inferential reasoning that is negative in character. The first thing that you have in place from Philo through Clement is a very careful via negativa, which arrives as a concept of God as one, which is stripped of all qualities and, in fact, is said to be nameless by both Justin and by Clement, and that that's all in place and embodied in the concepts of simplicity and impassibility before you ever get to the Trinitarian discussions. And none of it, but none of it, has a foundation in the Bible. That's the question I'm trying to get to. I think someone else should ask a question. Don. Don, we have microphones available. If, if you could step up. We're trying to record this, if you don't mind. What does John 1.14 mean? The First clause. Flesh. Yes. Yeah. Um, I think it means the word so completely identifies himself from conception with the man Jesus that the word has no identity apart from that identification. 
In other words, what, I, what I'm after, if you can use the old 17th century distinction between Lagos Incarnandus and Lagos Incarnatus, what I'm suggesting is that the pre-existent Son of God is already, by way of anticipation, what he will become in time. He is Lagos Incarnandus. This strikes me as an astonishing way of reading Ginnamai. Uh, of reading which? Ginnamai, the verb. Halagos uh, uh, Um for, for example, earlier in the same chapter, Pantadiotu um, Agenatu, that is to say, all things came to be through him. But you don't want to say something similar for Ginnamai there, because there was a time when the world was not. It was made yeah. ex nihilo. It's almost like a passive use of the verb to make. Yeah. And, and that's the common use. The same verb, uh, Ginnamai, is used likewise in, um, in Philippians 2. Um, henaomati anthropon agenatu. And uh, I, 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 it seems to me that, 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 that this raises huge problems for making the kind of identification leap that you're making. I'm not, I'm not following you. Well, just stick with John 1, yeah. um, 14. The word became flesh. Mm -hmm. On the face of it, that sounds like the word became something that the word was not. It could if that's all you had to work with. Well, it's not. That's why I compared or the, the same verb earlier in the chapter. The same verb occurs in, in John, uh, in, 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 um, in, um, in, in Philippians 2, in the, in the so-called mm -hmm. Christ hymn. And at, at that point, at that point, if that, that seems like a straightforward reading of the text, all right. It seems, and, and if one makes the distinction between identification and identity that Tom was making, then I, I, I'm, not sh I'm not sure that you've got a problem in reading it in a straightforward way. I mean, you probably have an answer to it all, but I, mm. at, at the moment I, I can't buy the moves you're making because of texts like that. It, it seems to me that when God gives himself in election before there is any creation and determines himself to be God for us in Jesus Christ, he is already in that act giving himself an identity by way of anticipation of what he will become in time. Now, unless you want to say the becoming involves a mutation in God, and I don't think you want to say that, then it seems to me that the historical becoming that is inaugurated by the actual assumption of flesh has to have an eternal uh, ground. And that's what I'm trying to describe. Otherwise, you've, all you're left with is some kind of mutability. Kevin. I'd like to ask about one of the few texts from the fourth gospel you didn't mention. Uh, John 12, verses 28 and 29. Jesus says, Father, glorify thy name. Yeah. And then a voice from heaven answers him. And I'm just wondering, could you talk to us about how to move from exegesis to ontology from that? Because I know you've said that God is a single subject, but I'm trying to understand what appears to be a mini dialogue. God and God. Yeah, I'm going to take that up in the Christological uh, uh, lecture. It's, it's because of the assumption of, of a human nature that the Logos has a vis-a-vis -vis relationship with the Father. It's not because there's three distinct individuals in the Trinity. It's not because of social Trinitarianism. It's because of the assumption of human nature that, that Jesus can, for example, pray to the Father. It's a, it's a human act. That's not an instrument so, of so it doesn't necessarily have to be, does it? I mean, Jesus prays. Uh, how does he do anything else? Well, according to the synoptics, he does it in the power of the Holy Spirit. He does it in precisely the same way you and I would have to do it, where we call to do it, by the power of the Spirit. Now, of course, we're not going to be called to do it because we're not hypostatically united to the Logos. He alone is the Redeemer. But he does it humanly. That is to say, in the power of the Spirit. Prayer is the same way. So, when the Father says, I, I have glorified your name and I will glorify it, he is already, and this is a close parallel, it seems to me, to the exaltation that occurs in Philippians 2, 9 through 11, uh, talking about declaring to the world the fact that this man belongs to the eternal identity of the one God of Israel. Don. 
so that I understand you, I'm not sure that I do at this juncture, um, would you say that before the creation of the world, Jesus the Son would have prayed to his Father the same way? No. So there is a distinction then between the address of the Word, the Son, before the Incarnation and afterwards. What I am, what I am suggesting is that the Logos as Incarnandus already relates to the humanity he will assume by way of a determination. That means he is already receptive even before he assumes the human nature. I, I can and what that means in practical terms, Don, is that the Holy Spirit is breathed forth by Father and Son not only to be the bond of unity that joins the two together, but to be the power of Father and Son in all activities ad extra. And that means that the second person of the Trinity, who I understand to be the second mode of being of the one single subject, the divine subject, never acts apart from the Spirit. And so I'm going to say in my lecture on the Trinity, I think that the Word creates through the Spirit. But if you are saying that when the Son addresses the Father before the world begins, be, began, there is a difference in how he addresses him then you've allowed space for this son to yeah. become what he was not. Yeah. Can Otherwise, we, I don't understand your can note. We, can we agree? I mean, I, I hope you agree with me in, a, in rejecting social Trinitarianism. Yes. Are we agreed on that? Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, mm, uh, there's such a discussion around that term that it depends a bit on what is meant by it, to be honest. Yeah, well, I laid all that out in the first yeah. lecture. Wasn't um, here. <laughs> it seems to me that if you work with the model I'm working with, one divine subject and three modes of being, then you can't talk about vis-a-vis -vis relationships in the same sense that you would if you're talking about embodied existence over, embod over against embodied existence. So when you talk about how the Son would have addressed the Father prior to the Incarnation, I don't have a real conception of that at all, and I don't know how you do. Except you did answer clearly no, and I was encouraged well, by that. I, now it seems to I be a backtracking. No, because I'm thinking ahead to Christology and thinking the way in which Jesus, for example, addresses the Father in prayer requires the assumption of flesh. Otherwise, it doesn't happen. Now, if you say requires the assumption of flesh, but before the creation of the world, there is no assumption. He doesn't bring his body with him from heaven, Correct. no. Correct. The Holy Spirit creates it in the womb of the Virgin. Correct. So there's a distinction. He becomes what he was not. He is already determined for that which he becomes, so his becoming is his being in eternity. He's determined in the mind of God, and the purposes of God. I agree with all yeah, of that. Yeah, but see, that, dr that drifts in the direction of making the pre-existence of Christ to be somehow uh, only in the, for in the, in the uh, foreknowledge of God and not in triune reality. Not the pre-existence of Christ, provided you make a distinction between identity and identification. Yeah. In other words, we get back to those problems again, twice in the book of Revelation, Christ uh, who was crucified before the foundation of the world. Yeah. Is there no sense in which he was not crucified before no. uh, AD 33? No, I, I agree. No. Oh. I fully believe Revelation. But how can Jesus Christ be crucified before the foundations of the world are laid, if he's not already Jesus Christ. If his identity is not only to already determined precisely for what he will become in time. But if you say that in terms me, of his purpose... Another, let me put it another way. Bart has a lovely passage in which, in which he says, the incarnation is a novum musterium to us, because we knew nothing about it until it happened, but it is not a novum musterium to God. I agree with that. He is already identified with this human being to come. I agree with that, so long as one does not confuse identity and the identification. Just arrived. <laughs> um, I have a yeah, related question. Um, uh, Professor George Hunsinger, in his election and the Trinity, the 25 Thesis of Karl Barth, he attempts to distinguish the eternal son as internal from the, the eternal son as incarnatus, which is in Sarkos. And he says, for the Son is the eternal necessarily, but he is only incarnandus, the Son that anticipates his incarnation, 
by contingency, only contingently. And so uh, you seem to think that the term is eternal uh, in the sense of incarnandus, necessarily, and therefore there is no contingency between the relation of the eternal son and uh, the incarnated Jesus. So the last part again, there's no relationship between what and what? There's no contingency between uh, the relation of the eternal son and the incarnated Jesus. And rather there is somehow an epistemological correspondence between them. Uh, namely, the historical Jesus is ontologically identical to the yeah. eternal son, but we only have access like epistemological access to the historic Jesus and not the eternal sin. Do you agree with that? No, not at all. Okay. Um, I have written theses of my own in response to Mr. Hunsinger. I don't know if you've read them. Um, I try to understand that. Have you read them? Oh, yeah. Um, I'm going to be dealing with the whole issue of divine freedom, contingency, all of that in Lecture 7, and I'd prefer to postpone my answer to that question until then. So uh, do you think there is a contingency or no? I don't think there is such a thing as a, a logos a sarcos as such. What I'm saying is yeah, logos yeah. a sarcos is incarnandus. And, and Mr. Hunsinger's distinction rests, has to rest on natural theology. It has no other basis, no other possible conceivable basis. And when Bardians start doing natural theology, it's all over. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I have one question, and it, keep it short, it is a question. Given your reading of the New Testament, um, would you say that the writers of the macro stitch came closer to the meaning of the New Testament and Christology than, say, the Niceno Constantinopolitan Creed? Tell me what you find in the macro stitch. Well, I find. Okay, I will. Uh, these elements, at least, I, uh, an utter denial of metaphysics. We should make no mention of Usia. I find a account of the pre-existence and deity of the sun, and I find a fairly pronounced ontological subordinationism, mm -hmm. or subordination, mm -hmm. I'll back off the ism. Yeah. Tom, I hope you won't take this the wrong way, but um, I want to make an observation. You are aggressively pursuing lines of questioning uh, to which answers are fully given in lectures five through seven. Good. And. Um, when I hear them pressed too soon, then I, I wonder what spirit animates the question and what's going on. Um, it seems to me that when you're developing a case and moving through step by step by step, um, it might be a good idea to see the whole picture before deciding that it's this or that, you know, consigning me to that heresy arc or that one. You know, one time I was lecturing at uh, Providence College during the conference that produced the volume uh, Divine Impassibility and the Mystery of Human Suffering. And uh, in the Q&A afterwards, two eminent Catholic theologians, Avery Cardinal Dulles on the one side and Tom Wynandy on the other, came to diametrically opposed conclusions. Dulles said I was an Arian and Wynandy said I was a modalist. Now, these are very smart, well-educated men. They both heard the same lecture. They both came to, I mean, they came to diametrically opposed conclusions. Now, what that suggested to me was they hadn't understood yet what I was saying. And in this particular lecture situation, where I haven't even gotten to the constructive moves yet, uh, it seems to me like you're asking me to give lectures five through seven before I've given them. Let's thank Professor McCormack for the talk. And uh, thank you all for coming.